Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Miro Tupac. Our topic for today, for the next 20 minutes, is uh, building a global search engine for genetic data. Uh, I'm a VP of engineering at DNA Stack, which is a company that has built a cloud platform for genomics, a Canadian cloud platform. Um, I'm actually here today to talk about a different project. Uh, I'm talking about the project which is called the Beacon Network, and that's something that we've developed uh, under the umbrella of an organization called the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. And you will see why this is fun. It's something uh, I started working on about four years ago. Uh, it actually started as my Google Summer of Code project, and later became my master's thesis, and now it's actually something that I get to work on as part of my job uh, occasionally. So, so much for the disclaimer. Why are we talking about this? So Beacon Network, to our knowledge, is currently the largest search and discovery engine for human genetic mutations, which is pretty cool. Uh, when I say it like this, the largest search engine, you're probably thinking that the kind of issues that we've been dealing with are around performance or scalability. But, and you know, it's partially true. We did hit some of these issues. We didn't anticipate that much traction initially. But the biggest issue for us was actually standardization. This, from the very beginning, was developed as a standard and as a driving force for a standard. And just getting people organized, uh, getting the right people involved, uh, you know, proposing this as a standard and just the whole communication around that, uh, that was the main issue. So like I said, this was developed as part of GA4GH, uh, which is essentially a standards body in genetics. It's a non-profit organization, uh, a coalition of over 500 institutions right now. Uh, they come from different fields, life sciences, disease advocacy, software, and they work together on creating standards for genetic data. GA4GH was founded in 2013, and basically a group of really smart people noticed that there was a huge opportunity to advance medicine, but we weren't really taking advantage of it. Uh, that opportunity was kind of driven by two trends. First of all, the cost of sequencing has decreased dramatically, about a million times in the previous few years, which has created an explosion of genetic data. Uh, the amount of genetic data, sequence data generated, uh, is actually doubling every seven months, which is beating Moore's law, and that's just incredible. But still, we're not really taking advantage of it. And the reason for that is fragmentation. The data is siloed by institutions, by countries, by diseases. Uh, different institutions use incompatible methods. Tools are not compatible. Regulations aren't ready for technical advances. And these were the problems. So the Global Alliance was created to address these issues. So what did they do? Well, they thought, we know that data sharing is the key to making new discoveries. So how do we enable this? Uh, how do we make this happen? And they decided that they would like to test this. Uh, as every scientist, they decided to run an experiment. And that experiment came in the form of the Beacon Project. So the Beacon Project came with a very simple premise. Essentially, uh, they decided that we should implement a very simple web service that accepts a question of the form do you have any information about this genetic mutation? And the service responds, yes or no. So it's very minimal, literally response with a single bit of information, but that was actually really crucial at the beginning. It was later extended, you know, once we knew that people were willing to share data, uh, it kind of evolved into a more generalized query language, the response was extended as well. But initially, the simplicity was actually very crucial. It had to be technically simple. Uh, that was a very important design principle, because it was an experiment, and you know, if you have to spend significant resources to participate in this experiment, it just wouldn't work. And remember that you're not dealing with software companies, you're dealing with scientists, with research institutions. So simple means actually really, really simple. That one bit of information was also uh, very important. Basically the idea was to expose so little information that nobody would think that it has any implications on privacy. And later on that actually turned out not to be quite the case, but that's a story for another time. And simplicity is also relevant for uh, public data sharing, which obviously is the most open form of data sharing, but it also has technical implications, right? You don't need to deal with authentication authorization, so those are very fast implemented as well. So this was a really good proposal that got a lot of traction quickly. The first few services were created within a couple of weeks, but there was a problem. There was no standard for the API. So of course, everybody implemented this differently. And you would be surprised how many differences you can get with such a simple definition of such a simple API. You know, people were using different request methods, different parameters, different domains or notations even for the same overlapping parameters, different response tags. We had everything from plain text, you know, JSON, XML, full picture, HTML. To this day, we actually maintain compatibility with all the previous beacons. So to this day, we're actually parsing HTML. 
and not even like nice HTML. I mean, like HTML with CSS, JavaScript, everything. So it was a mess. So we decided to introduce the Beacon Network. And there were basically two reasons for this. We wanted to give you a single location where you can query all these services, and also just perform all these mappings and conversions for you. And that's how it all started. It just we just created sort of a unified API for all these beacons. And that was driving the development of the standard, which was then feeding back to the Internet group. So we had this sort of a feedback loop uh, going on. So here's a picture of the first version of the app, uh, as it was four years ago. Uh, sadly, my design skills have not improved much since then. But thankfully, our front end team has taken over the development, and it actually looks different right now. I will try to do a short demo, just so that you can see what this looks like. Uh, so if you go to beacon-network.org, you will see a web page like this. Uh, there's a search field. There's a list of participating organizations, some press references, links to GitHub, documentation, that sort of thing. But the search field is the important thing here. So here you can type a genetic mutation. I'm just going to use one that's really well known. It's actually associated with breast cancer, just as an example. And there is a very specific format to this query string. It's actually really simple to explain. So you probably know that DNA can be represented as a string of letters, a very long string, about 3 billion letters per individual. So in order to specify a mutation, you basically need to say two things. Where in this string and what letter, right? And that's what you're saying here. So the basic alphabet for these are letters A, C, G, and T, as you may remember from high school biology. So the first number here is the chromosome identifier. The second number, the 32 million something, is the position within that chromosome, and then Technically, I just need to give you one letter because I've specified the position exactly, but quite often you specify it as a div. So here I'm saying a healthy individual would have a G in that position, but I'm actually looking for a guy that has a C in that position. And there's a couple of reasons why I specify it like this. Uh, first of all, this kind of div format allows you to better capture more complex mutations, like insertions and deletions of all strings. And it's also kind of practical. From a biological standpoint, we're all very similar. You know, our, our DNA is going to overlap massively between us. So why would you store all 3 billion letters if you can only store, let's say, 3 million, which would be a like, reasonable number for an individual. So quite often, you actually store it as a div. And you store it as a div to a reference genome. There's a couple of versions of this. And that's the first toggle at the beginning here. So that's kind of like the base for my div. So I specify a mutation like this. And then I just click search. And what the search engine does is it uh, takes a query, does conversion to some canonical informal, uh, internal form, and then it determines which services it actually needs to talk to to be able to answer this query. It distributes the query to the services, collects the responses, and shows you the result. I'm actually tethering over my phone. I wasn't able to get the Wi-Fi working, so it, this appears to be really slow. But let's see. Let's give it a second, maybe. Oh, I actually got disconnected, so I will have to skip this one. I have a picture for what that would look like, uh, though, just in case. Uh, basically, you get this really long list of institutions, and it's sort of the beacon format of the API, so you can see yes or no on the right side as found as not found. Some beacons might expose more information can sort of browse through that. Some might give you a URL to some authorized system uh, where you can get more information. So it's kind of like the first discovery uh, point of contact. Uh, and you can see that some really cool institutions are participating in this. Uh, you have big research institutes like Wolfgang for Sanger. You have really big data aggregators such as Google. And there's a really cool data actually there. So this brings us uh, back to the standard. In, in the standard, we're currently on version 0.4. We've been through a couple of versions. And like I said, we've extended the query language as well as the response. If you want to know, you know what exactly happened, feel free to look it up. Uh, for the purpose of this talk, I think what's more interesting is just the learning path here. So at first, uh, with 0.1, we really just wanted to formalize the early definition of the service, you know, accept this question, respond yes or no. And we chose Apache Avro uh, as the format, which is great for data models, but not so great for APIs. So we actually didn't specify things like endpoints or you know what kind of request method you're supposed to use. So that turned out to be really vague and actually didn't have significant adoption. And primarily, that vagueness and ambiguity in interpretation was the problem. So we thought, OK, that was clearly a mistake. Let's address this with 
So with 0.2, we're really focused on the vagueness aspect of the thing. So we basically went overboard and tried to kind of over-standardize or over-prescribe everything, and actually led to a very complex protocol, which turned out to be quite a significant barrier for adoption again. So again, problems with adoption, but for a different reason. Turns out that people were actually buying into this because it was so simple. So by constructing a really complex protocol, that it simply didn't work out quite well. Beacon project was still popular during uh, you know, the time when 0.2 was the active spec. Actually, around 60 beacons were created, which is pretty good. But only one of them would be strictly compatible with the spec. So most of the time, people chose to implement some variation of the specification for pragmatic reasons, which means that we simply didn't get it right, and the specification did not reflect what people actually needed. So with Block on 3, uh, we really took a step back. We got the right people involved. We really essentially rewrote everything from scratch, simplified it, and that has gotten a lot of traction and uh, really good feedback. So I feel like we really got it right with this version. One thing we didn't get right, though, was developer friendliness, essentially. We were using Avro at the time. We were looking into using protocol buffers. It turned out that developers actually don't like working with these. Uh, they're a bit too complex uh, for this purpose. So with Open Core, we've actually migrated to Open API, and so far we really have it. So the Beacon network itself is uh, a Java E application. It's running on Wildfly and distributed to Docker. It actually consists of nine services uh, or subsystems. The data subsystem there takes care of access to the database. It's standard JPA and MySQL. Surveys is sort of the core of the business logic. So it takes care of things like query normalization, participant resolution, distributing the queries across the network. So it's sort of like level one neuralization in the system. And then, once you get the query from the service layer, you go to, to the processor subsystem. So processor receives a query and takes care of query execution against the particular region. So it's kind of like level two parallelization. And the problem we had here uh, was basically the fact that there are so many different variations of the API, uh, and sometimes the behavior even depends on the parameters. Oh, okay. Uh, so basically, we just couldn't get it working reasonably with static configuration, and we needed something more dynamic. So we figured out this option where basically we're storing this logic in the database. So we have the system where we have sort of four-stage pipeline of executing a query against each beacon. Each of these stages is implemented as a class. You resolve it from the database. You you know patch the class. You instantiate it as a CDIB or an EJB, depending on what you need. So you have this sort of highly parallelized Java E pipeline for a query. So the first stage, converter, basically takes care of mapping the internal representation to the language that the particular service speaks. Once you have that, you go to the requester, which takes the URL, takes the converted parameters, constructs, constructs a request, and passes it forward to the fetcher. So fetcher just takes the request and actually does the network call, talks, talks to an ex external service, deals with network errors, that sort of thing, and obtains the raw response. And then you have parsers, which take the raw response, and extract the information that you're actually looking for. So they also deal with you know, parsing errors, different data formats, that sort of thing. And just to, to give you sort of the idea of how many variations of things there are, even though it is, I think, pretty nicely structured, we actually have, I think, 14 converters, 11 requesters, two fetchers, and like 18 parsers. So just you know, multiply this and see how many different variations of the APIs there are. Mapper is just a simple translation layer between different internal representations of the object. And REST is basically API gateway. So this actually has a REST API in both XML, legacy, or JSON, the new one. This is what the query execution looks like. You have beacons on the right side. You have the individual pipelines that are managed by processors. Then you have sort of cross beacon aggregation at the service layer. And then you have a API. So we've done actually quite a lot of data science around this. You know, once you have uh, a network that extends a single institution or a single data set, you can get quite interesting insights. I don't have time to go into all these details, but uh, I wanted to share at least some basic statistics. So we have currently around 100 installations uh, of the beacons from 40 different institutions uh, all around the globe on all the continents, except for Antarctica. There's a model of sequencing going on there. Uh, in terms of how big the searches actually are, uh, because of the way this is structured, where each institution uh, sort of you know takes care of their individual service, sometimes you don't know how much data you're actually querying. So if I had to extrapolate from the data sets that we know of, uh, 
I, I would say that we're probably looking at around 2 million samples and 2 billion genetic variations, which is very substantial. Uh, we have a bunch of users from all over the world. I think you can truly call it a global system, around 13,000 unique users. Uh, in terms of traffic, the system has reached uh, 1 million searches in September of last year. So right now, we'd probably be at somewhere around 1.5 million. So it's not an awful lot of queries. By the way, these are not API hits. These are actual searches through the network. And typically, you, you query multiple beacons in a single search. So this actually results in about 7 million queries being distributed through the network. So if you did the map on this, it's about 1,500 per day on average. In peak days, we have as many as 85,000. And that's about 10 searches per minute, or you know, let's say 12 to 1,300 per minute in peak times, which is not a lot. You probably work on a system that handles more requests. But taking into account that it's such a niche field, this is basically used by geneticists, and every individual search you know, handles so much data, this is actually pretty cool. We looked at a bunch of other information as well, sort of more domain specific. We looked at uh, what are the popular mutations that people look for, what are the popular chromosomes, assemblies, what genes these mutations are associated with, what diseases these genes are associated with, sort of like transitively. Uh, you know, transitively. And uh, I'm happy to go into more detail individually after the talk. Don't have time to get into this. But basically, all of these yielded to some interesting results. So it turned out that all the searches are actually really focused. People are looking for very similar things. There's definitely a couple of diseases that are targeted really heavily. Uh, people are searching for rare variants and uh, harmful variants, which is pretty cool. It means that they are actually using it to find information about something that they potentially see in their own data sets. And yeah, it's uh, cool data. And that's basically it. This is all open source on GitHub, so if you're interested in contributing, the first link on the slides is actually linked to the Beacon Network code base. The second link is the link to the main Beacon space on GitHub. There's a specification. Uh, I would be happy to point you to, to some other cheap or cheap projects that they do a lot of cool stuff. If you think this is really cool, potentially so cool that you'd like to work on this on a full-time basis, uh, DNS Tech is hiring. We are looking for software uh, engineers, primarily senior Java developers. Uh, to work on a platform that basically takes this to the next level and brings this to the enterprise. And the last link is just my blog. I have some information about uh, these beacons there as well. You can just want to catch all the press. So thank you. And if you have any questions. Okay. Yeah. So the question is how fast the search is. Uh, it's actually pretty fast. There's a lot of caching going on, to be fair. But even if there was no caching to query these 100 services, you would get the response from everybody, let's say, within 45 seconds. So it's relatively interactive, yeah. Um, regarding like, the number of queries, how much is the standard if you go back in time and tell yourself or whatever was working on? Zero dot one, and what the top projection is holding the climbing standard across that many organizations. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I mean, we learned some of these lessons, like you know, maybe not go with Apache Avro or protocol buffers that specify the data model as opposed to the API. Uh, it's it's kind of hard to say how I would have done things differently. Because at the time, that was the correct choice. Uh, this technology stack was you know, chosen because it was compatible with what the rest of the GA4 G8 was using uh, and things like that. Uh, yeah, I think the most crucial, crucial thing would be maybe get the people who are actually going to be implementing these beacons to be heavily involved in the design of the standard. Uh, the first few iterations were done by the people who you know, deal with genetic data but are not necessarily the people actually implementing these services. And I think that would have helped. Right, so uh, at, at the level of this system, there is not actually anything interesting algorithmically going on. Minus maybe some breadth for search to de you know you know determine which beacons are participating in a query, 
this system doesn't host any data, right? It only sort of federates queries to the actual individual system. So uh, uh, at the level of the individual systems, yeah, th there is some stuff that you need to do, but it's mostly pretty simple. It's at the level of having the raw files and being able to index them in some reasonable way in a database. Like most of these queries are position-based lookups, so you know it's nothing too too crazy. Yeah, so I'm not familiar with this area at all, so I'm just wondering, could you give an example of how a scientist would actually use something like this, like what they would be doing that would have to be yeah, so uh, uh, this is basically for data discovery. That's the main use case. So kind of just finding out if anybody else has seen this data. So although, although this is not a clinical tool, it's more of a research tool. Uh, an example could be, you know, I'm a doctor. I have a patient with a particular genetic mutation. And I, I suspect that this mutation causes something, but I'm not sure what. And it's very rare. I haven't seen this before. So my first question could be, you know, has anybody else in the world seen this? So I could go to this Beacon Network, look up this particular mutation, and I see, okay, it's in, in this database from this research institute, and then I reach out to them and see, you know, what kind of conditions they had around that particular mutation. Yeah, so this really depends on each individual institution. So we are, we are actually end, uh, adding the functionality right now where you can sort of contact people by email if they gave us that information. Sometimes we just don't have that. Uh, so it re really depends. Some organizations have a separate portal where you can access more info, so you just go to the portal. Sometimes it can be you know emailing somebody. Sometimes maybe you can't get access unless you go through some like rigorous approval process through data access committee. It, it really depends on how sensitive the data is and what the institution is. But yeah, usually it starts with an email to somebody. So one of the things you mentioned was uh, the I think it's a good first point of contact. Uh, in terms of traffic, it is sort of gradually increasing. Uh, not rapidly, it's, uh, it's pretty steady. And that kind of reflects how I feel about people sharing this data. It's uh, basically people were very cautious about this for you know, obvious and good reasons. Uh, there's regulations and you know, all sorts of privacy concerns. But gradually, I feel like people are warming up to the idea and are realizing that you know, sharing is the only way to go and that's just what it takes. So it's still, you know, the, these kind of things, they're getting incorporated into regulations and consent forms and all sorts of things like that. So it's a slow process, but I feel like it's kind of on the right track. Okay, thank you.